Hi, I'm Nick Lathaby, the IoT Ecosystem Manager at Texas Instruments. I'm going to present on how to debug program crashes of TI's ROV debugger, including a number of actual product demonstrations to show this. We'll start by discussing some of the causes of program crashes. And I'll give you a quick overview of ROV and the actual demonstration setup we have. But I'm going to home in during the demonstrations and some associated slides on three specific problem types we're going to debug. That's looking for stack and buffer overflows, detecting memory leaks, and how to use device exceptions to find the causes of program crashes. There's obviously a lot of reasons why an embedded program might crash. One common error, for example, would be program logic incorrect. However, that type of problem is often fairly easy to identify and resolve. A much more difficult problem would be if you have bugs in the hardware causing transient glitches that are difficult to reproduce. Two more system level problems that can lead to difficult to debug program crashes are memory corruption and resource exhaustion. Examples of memory corruption might include stack overflows or buffer or array overflows, bad pointers, an incorrect memory map, or code that's not interruptible or thread safe. Resource exhaustion can occur in a number of cases. For example, memory leaks where you run out of memory that you are dynamically allocating is one common cause of crashes. The second one might be a missed real-time deadline. So you simply don't have the CPU cycles needed to meet a real-time deadline given the way you've written your code. These type of problems are particularly difficult to debug for a number of reasons. One is that they are hard to reproduce because they may take either a long time to occur, such as, for example, in a slow memory leak, or there may be specific circumstances that cause them to occur. So imagine, for example, a real-time deadline might only be missed in very, very specific circumstances caused by a rare sequence of events. Memory corruption is particularly nasty in that the symptoms can change. Let's say, for example, you see you've got some type of problem. You then make some changes to your application. At that point, you've moved code and data around, and now the problem might just go away or it might become different because now you have a different piece of data being corrupted. In fact, one issue I've seen with memory corruption problems is that they can lie latent in a particular code base. When that code base is used in a new application with a different memory map, all of a sudden these bugs can be exposed because now they are corrupting locations that actually have critical data. We'll show you how to use TI's ROV debugger to either proactively detect some of these program crash causes or at least quickly detect the cause when they occur. In addition to demonstrating ROV and how it works, we'll take you behind the scenes a little bit to show you some of the runtime instrumentation techniques that can be applied to actually enable detection of these type of problems. And you can then use these techniques for your application, even if you're using different tools and runtime environments to what we are demonstrating here. Before proceeding any further, let's take a look at the actual demonstration hardware and setup. The embedded programs will be running on a simple link CC1312R launchpad. The simple link CC1312 is a wireless MCU that supports sub one gigahertz communication. On the PC, we have CoComposer Studio, which is an integrated development environment. We're going to abbreviate this to CCS going forward. CoComposer Studio can run on Macs, PCs, and Linux machines. It's an Eclipse based IDE, so if you're familiar with Eclipse, you should have no problem using it. CoComposer Studio then connects via a USB cable to the CC1312 launchpad for downloading programs and doing debug control. The CCS IDE 
contains a number of additional tools beyond simple compile, link, and debug. One of these is the ROV system level debugger. That stands for Runtime Object Viewer. ROV displays information about key system data structures, such as stacks, heaps, or tasks. How it performs is it reads and walks data structures when the target is halted, uploads that information into the debugger, and then produces informational displays for the developer. Some of the system level debugging information may require specialized debug libraries or instrumented data structures down on the target hardware. We'll explain when these are needed and exactly how they work when we go through some of the specific debug scenarios later in this presentation. Finally, ROV works out of the box with TIR TOS, which provides users an ability to optionally turn on debug instrumentation to support its system level debug features. However, ROV can be customized to work with any data structure if you're willing to create the appropriate mapping that represents it in ROV. Let's start looking at some of the specific debug problems that can cause program crashes. We're going to start with how you catch stack and buffer overflows. Stack and buffer overflows are a frequent source of memory corruption. Since RAM is often a precious resource in embedded systems, especially in MCUs with limited on-chip memory, developers typically need to conserve RAM and avoid wasting it. As a result, you want to make stacks and buffers as small as possible. But if you make them too small, stack overflow occurs when the stack is too small. Stack is used to store the context for each function call you make. In this little code example here, we start by having a get input function that puts its parameters, return address, and any locals it creates on the stack. It in turn calls update display, which puts its parameters, return address, and locals in the stack. And then update display calls write block. Write block starts again, of course, by putting its parameters and return address on the stack. And that creates a large local variable called temp buff. As we can see here, temp buff is now gone past the end of the stack and any data you have in memory past the end of the stack will now be corrupted and given wrong values. Obviously, you're going to want to detect the stack overflow as soon as possible, preferably before it causes some obscure, difficult to diagnose bug. To do this, you can initialize the stack with a specific pattern. TIRTOS provides an option for the developer to ask for the stack to be initialized with the hex BE through every value in the stack. ROV can then read the different values in the stack, and if the top value is not BE, it will assume stack overflow. This method has an additional advantage. It also enables stack size optimization because you can simply look at where the first BE value occurs in the stack, identify that as a high water mark. And assuming you've had an extensive set of program runs and can be confident this really is the high watermark the stack will achieve ever, you can then optimize the stack size to reflect that. The overhead of doing this is very low. You have about 160 bytes of code to do the BE initialization, and it happens only when the RTOS is initialized, which means your boot times are slightly longer, but the rest of your program execution is not affected. In addition to using a debug tool like ROV to show stack overflow, you can also check for it at runtime. The way TIRTOS does this is it has a specific routine that checks whether a task stack has overflowed. This routine is called at context switch times and checks the stack of both the task being swapped out and the task being swapped in. If this function detects an error, it will halt execution and print an error message in the console. And you'll see this in the demo we're about to do. The overhead from a code perspective is quite low with only 200 bytes needed for the stack checking function. Of course, this can be removed. However, you need to be aware that context switch times will now be longer because you're also checking stack peaks during the context switch. 
And you may ask, if you have a debugger like ROV that can show you when a stack overflow has occurred, why do you need to check it at runtime as well? There's several good reasons. Firstly, you can halt execution immediately that a stack overflow is detected, which means you can then deal with the problem there and then and look at, for example, stack trace back to see what circumstances led to the overflow. Second, if you have a system going out for field test, it's useful to have debug instrumentation in that system so that these type of problems are detected and caught and you can work out why they happened later on. And then finally, one issue with purely software-based debug solutions, such as what we're showing you here, is that if, for example, the stack overflow corrupts things like task control blocks, at that point, you may not be able to see these stacks when you try and use a debugger like ROV. So actually having a routine that catches the overflow straight away is very advantageous. Now we're going to go ahead and actually do a demonstration of ROV and how it detects stack overflow and shows you stack size. We've already set up CCS and downloaded a program onto the CC1312 launch pad. This is a very simple program that simply creates two user tasks. And additionally, there's a third thread that TIRTOS creates automatically called the idle thread. I have deliberately set the stack size of the two user-defined threads to be too low to accommodate the maximum stack size for both threads. What we're going to do now is run the program that we've already downloaded and it's sitting at main. And then we're going to view in ROV, which is this window here, what the stack size is and stack overflow situation is. Now we've just started executing and you'll notice that execution has been stopped and this is because the runtime stack checker has spotted a stack overflow and has actually stopped execution. And we'll look at that error in a little bit more detail in a minute, but let's first look at ROV. If we click on the task module, it will show a number of bits of information about tasks, including over here, the stack peak and the stack size. So we can see here that we've set the stack size of the two user-defined tasks, that's the console thread and the temperature thread, to 456 bytes. In one case, the console thread did not exceed that stack size. But in the other case, the temperature thread did reach or exceed that stack size. And therefore, we know that we almost certainly have a stack overflow situation. So you can see here, just completely proactively we've detected this stack overflow situation without having to do any real debugging and we can now simply go in and increase that stack size to something until we no longer get stack overflow the second advantage obviously of this display is that you can optimize your stack sizes so if you look at the idle task we'll see here that we've allocated a k to it but we've only used 668 bytes Obviously, we want to do more extensive system test runs before we make definitive conclusions on what the maximum stack size is. But let's imagine we had done many, many program runs and never seen a stack peak above 668. At that point, we could reduce this stack size and allocate that memory to other parts of the program to help them run more efficiently. And now I'm just going to show the runtime stack error checking. The runtime stack checking routine is called at context switch time. In this case, it checked the stack and discovered an overflow. And if we look at the task ID, we can see it's the very same task ID as the temperature thread, which caused the overflow that was visible in ROV. So the stack checking routine has detected the overflow, printed out a message to console, and then terminated execution, allowing you to immediately start diagnosing what led up to that stack overflow and to address the problem. So again, we've caught the, pro the problem immediately before it created any difficult to diagnose symptoms caused by a memory corruption related crash later in program execution. Another form of overflow that can cause data corruption is buffer overflow, where you put too much data into a buffer and it overflows past the end. 
corrupting any data structures residing there. If we look at the very simple code sequence on the left here, we use malloc to create an 8-byte buffer. We then copy an 8-byte string to that buffer using string copy, but have forgotten about the backslash new line character. So as a result, we now have an overflow and the character past the end of the buffer is now corrupted. It would be nice to be able to catch this proactively. How this is done in TIRTOS is TIRTOS has a debug heap, and we'll discuss this in more detail in the next section. And if you use that debug heap, it adds four bytes of scribble bits to detect buffer overflows at the end of each buffer. And we'll also demonstrate the buffer detection overflow capability in our next demonstration. Now, of course, a lot of embedded applications may want to use static buffer creation rather than dynamic buffer allocation. In this case, you could employ a very similar technique where you use, say, for example, a C++ class that adds scribble bits to the end of each buffer and checks for overflows. And that way, even with statically created buffers, you can still catch these type of overflow problems. We're now going to look at another cause of program crashes, memory leaks, and how you can proactively detect these before your actual application crashes due to lack of memory. If your application has routines that allocate memory buffers dynamically, but then fail to actually free them, then you'll have a memory leak, and eventually your system will run out of memory. One challenge is that if the memory leak is slow, you may need to run your program for days to replicate the problem. And this obviously complicates diagnosis. Similarly to stacks, heaps and buffer pools reside in RAM, and therefore you want to optimize their size to conserve RAM for the rest of the application. Now, whether the stack overflow detection we showed you previously required very little instrumentation, Leak detection requires an additional library in TIRTOS called HeapTrack to be linked into the build. So there's definitely more code overhead and more runtime overhead associated with detecting memory leaks and understanding the size of heaps. HeapTrack is a buffer management module that tracks all currently allocated blocks for any TIRTOS heap instance. And TIRTOS has a number of pre-built heap types, such as multi-pool buffers, as well as regular variable-sized Malloc-style heaps. In addition, you can define your own heap and have that incorporated as a TIRTOS heap as well. What heap track does is essentially replaces all the memory allocation calls that TIRTOS has with its own implementations that adds additional tracking for any blocks being allocated and freed. Heap track can do the following. It can detect overwriting at the end of allocated buffers, which we discussed previously in the presentation. It can also detect if the same block is freed twice. Its record of memory allocation and deallocation enables you to quickly work out if memory leaks are going on and what the likely source of them are. And then finally, it also tracks the size of the heap, and it gives you two numbers here, as you'll see, both with and without heap track packets, because uh, obviously heap track, as you'll see later, is adding additional data structures to track heap allocation. What we're going to do now is have a quick demonstration of ROV showing you the kind of information that HeapTrack can give you. So we're back in Code Composer Studio here, and this time we're using a slightly different program called MemoryLeak.c. And it's really a very trivial illustration of the features and how ROV can help you. If we look in this for loop here, you'll see that we have a for loop that goes around 10 times and allocates a 64-byte buffer and then allocates a 128-byte buffer. And then it frees the 64-byte buffer but doesn't free the 128-byte buffer. Once we execute that for loop, we're then going to allocate a buffer of eight bytes and then string copy in an eight byte string, which after you add the backslash new line is going to overflow that buffer. I'm going to start by setting a breakpoint here so we can illustrate the heat tracking features and then show the buffer overflow immediately after that. 
So I've set up my breakpoint. I'm now going to execute the program. And we have to wait a little bit here while the program gets to the breakpoint. So we've hit the breakpoint. Now we can use ROV to start studying what's going on in the heap. So we're going to go down here and select heap track because that's the actual heap we're using. And the first display that comes up is a basic display. And you'll see you've got these two numbers here, what's currently used and what was high watermark off the heap. We show you two numbers here, both the numbers with heap tracker, which adds additional data structures to each heap block and then without heap track data. And that's obviously important because your real application you ship in production may well not be using heap track and won't have this additional overhead of packets. So this gives you your basic heap sizing information, which you can then use to optimize the size of the heap. Then we're gonna to switch to what's known as the task allocation list, which shows you which tasks are allocating which blocks. So if we click on this task here, you'll see we have pretty obvious allocation history. And this is where we've gone through the for loop and we've allocated those 10, 128 byte blocks, but never freed them. Whether on the other hand, we don't see the 64 byte blocks because each one of those is freed. If you're wondering why the actual size we're showing is 136, that's because malloc adds eight bytes to any buffer you allocate. And that's how it is able to then free the buffer without you specifying the size. In addition to recording the size of each allocation, you obviously record which task allocated it. And we also record the clock tick so you know when it was allocated. And we also record whether an overflow occurred or not. So whether or not this is a memory leak depends on how your application is structured. Let's say, for example, you have one task allocating a whole pool of buffers and a separate task is then taking those buffers, processing them, and then deallocating them. It might be quite acceptable to have this task allocating and never freeing these 10 buffers. But obviously, if you know that this task is supposed to allocate and free those buffers, straight away you'd see there's a memory leak here. So let's go on now and see what happens when we execute on this particular buffer overflow problem. So we're going to step into here. We look down here, we just allocated this 8-byte buffer along with the 8 bytes malloc uses to free it without knowing the size. And then when we actually perform the allocation, immediately now we've triggered, yes, there was an overflow because, of course, we wrote nine characters in when you include the backslash new line, and there are only eight characters in the buffer. So straight away we've seen there's this buffer overflow. We we've know it right away, and you can can now go in, work out what the problem is and fix it. You don't have to then deal with some obscure crash and work out why that happened much later in the program when the corrupted data is actually used. Before we move on from the topic of identifying potential problems with dynamic memory allocation, I want to just look in more detail at how heap track functions. As I mentioned earlier, it replaces the allocation and free calls with its own implementations that add additional instrumentation to the memory allocations and free so you can actually understand what's going on. Specifically, every time a buffer or block is allocated on the heap, heap track adds an extra data packet. And this is why the size of the heap is greater when you use heap track than when you purely just use your own application because of this additional allocated block. You can see here this block includes the scribble bits, which detect overflows, and they're also used for detecting double freeze of a allocated buffer or block. Then a uh, heap track itself, the heap is implemented as a linked list, so there's obviously pointers to the next and previous elements in the linked list. Then, as you probably remember, we track the size of each allocated block and the time the block was allocated and then the task that allocated the block. So all that information you are seeing in the ROV display comes from walking the heap track heap and simply reading out and analyzing the data in the heap track data packet. So let's move on to the final topic in our debugging program crashes, and that's how to use device exceptions. If you think back to our initial slides that discussed common causes of program crashes, memory corruption was certainly one we focused on. 
Now, while we've already covered some causes of memory corruption, such as buffer or stack overflows, you can simply have individual pointers of incorrect values or some kind of corrupted value that can lead to incorrect memory accesses. Once you have an incorrect memory access happening, there's a pretty good chance it'll generate a CPU hardware fault. And that in turn will trigger an exception, which is basically an interrupt with information on the cores. So CPU exceptions enable you to detect problems immediately or soon after they occur. And that makes diagnosis a lot simpler. To give you an example, if you go back in time to older CPU architectures, which didn't necessarily have a wide range of exceptions, if you have a bad data value that then causes you to start executing data, the program can run on just executing random data as instruction for a very, very long time before it actually crashes. And at that point, it may not be possible even with very, very deep trace buffers in the logic analyzer to detect the problem. However, if you have a CPU exception triggered by executing an illegal instruction, at that point, as soon as your program starts trying to execute random data, you'll get an exception, stop right there, and then have a much greater chance of being able to diagnose the fault. So you can see here that the approach of using CPU exceptions is a little bit different to what we showed earlier. Earlier, you could proactively see things like stack overflows and buffer overflows happening before they actually cause a crash. What a CPU exception enables you to do is to typically immediately halt the system and start diagnosing a crash very close to when it occurs rather than at some point much, much later in time. Now, one important thing is that since a CPU exception is an interrupt, it requires a handler. However, compared to a typical interrupt, which will have a unique handler, generally all CPU exceptions will have a common handler that will simply note there's been an exception, note the actual value of the exception to help diagnosis, and then stop the system and enable you to then work out what happened. Let's discuss some of the exceptions that can help you catch memory corruption problems. In the diagram on the screen here, I've taken an embedded application and broken it up into its various ELF sections. And ELF is essentially the object format produced by a cross compiler. So what you'll see here in yellow, we have code, which is in the .txt section, and constant data, which is in the .ro data section. So that particular segment of memory, you obviously want to be able to read it, but you don't want to be able to write it. In the green, we have both initialized and uninitialized data. And then in most embedded applications, you're typically not going to use the whole processor address space. For example, a MCU that's running a one megabyte application is going to not have memory over the vast majority of a four gigabyte address space. So let's see how exceptions can really help here. Let's start off with maybe a corrupted pointer that ends up pointing into non-existent memory. Well, if that happens, you're going to get a bus fault exception, as you can see on the here. And that will then stop the program there and then. And you can see what caused that exception and fixed it. Let's imagine that your corrupt pointer is causes a write to one of your code or constant data sections. Well, obviously there, those are now read only if you set up the memory protection unit correctly. And that will then generate a memory protection unit exception because you've now tried to write to read only data. So again, that's another class of potential memory corruption to be captured. Now, obviously with the data sections of your program, it's hard to protect those from corruption because you are allowed to read and write those sections. However, let's say you end up corrupting the program counter somehow and you start trying to execute arbitrary data from the data segments of your program. At that point, you're going to get an undefined instruction exception. So you can see here these different CPU exceptions are very good at detecting errors caused by memory corruption or register corruption. So what we're going to do now is jump into a demo. And before I do that, I'd like to discuss the actual program we're going to use to generate the exceptions. During the ROV demonstration, we're going to use the program shown below. 
you look at the bottom of the program, what you'll see is there's a couple of commented out lines. And the first of those commented out lines generate an assembly language instruction with a invalid opcode. And that would generate an invalid instruction exception. And the line below that actually performs a write to non-existent memory. And what you'll see in the program we run is we're going to uncomment out that second line and show you what happens when we perform a write to non-existent memory. So let's jump into the CCS demonstration right now. So we're now sitting in CoComposer Studio and we've downloaded the program onto the CC1312 board. It's waiting at main and I'm going to start running the program. Now, I happen to know that the exception handler I've selected is simply a spin loop. So the target's not going to actually stop running. It's simply going to sit there in a spin loop when the exceptions occur. So I actually need to s suspend execution. At this point, I can click on the hardware interrupt module. And if you remember, I told you that an exception is a hardware interrupt. So we click on that and lo and behold, we are now seeing that there is an exception that has occurred there. And if you look here, we have the exception has been decoded and it was a bus fault. And if you recall, the instruction that was generating that problem was in fact, a access to non-existent memory, which will generate exactly this, a bus fault. So as soon as that bus fault's occurred, we've had the exception generated. And then even more usefully, ROV adds the call stack information. So now you have some idea about where the exception occurred. So if we look here, one of the places it happened was exception.c line 75. So let's check on exception.c. And if we look in there, go down to about line 75, we see we've got a routine called sleep, which is uh, one of the places that was called originally. And that is all very close to where the actual bad instruction was. So you can see here that this exception and the associated call stack allows you to zero in pretty precisely on where the problem may be in your code. In addition to the basic decode of the exception and the stack trace, there's also a lot of additional information you can see here, such as we can dump all the registers, stack sizes, the thread that was running, and that all may be useful for you to help diagnose the problem. But I wanted to focus on the basic decode and the stack trace because those really are extremely useful in getting you zeroed in on many exceptions. To go behind the scenes on how the ROV actually obtains the exception information. We'll look at what TIRTOS does. When the CPU exception occurs, it straight away captures the program counter value and the exception code. That enables ROV to obviously display the exception code, decode it, and also show the stack tracebacks. It knows what the program counter value is. Then it calls a handler and TIRTOS has three default handlers and also allows a user defined handler. Now during the debugging phase of your program, you can probably simply use one of the predefined TIRTOS exception handlers. And we chose to use the spin loop handler. If we chosen either the enhanced or the minimal decoding handler, we would have seen a great deal of that exception information also printed out to the console and CCS. Once you go to production, you're likely to want to use a user-defined handler. And you can base that on one of the exception handlers that we provide. For example, if you want to provide some debug console display, if an exception occurs, you could start off with the enhanced or the minimal decoding handler and then add some custom code to do whatever system shutdown or any other operation you feel needs to be performed. So at this point, we're done with the detailed demonstration explanation of how ROV can be used to help debug the causes of a number of program crashes. And I'd like to wrap things up with a summary before giving you some links where you can get further information. So to summarize, ROV can be very helpful in preventing and detecting the causes of program crashes. You can use it to proactively check for stack or buffer overflows and for memory leaks. 
and catch those problems before they manifest themselves in an actual crash or system failure. If your program then does crash for other reasons, ROV shows exceptions and the associated call stack with them to simplify diagnosing the crash. If you'd like to try out ROV yourself, you can download it as part of Code Composer Studio from the link shown on this slide. To get an SDK that contains TIRTOS, which has a number of pre-instrumented data structures, including stacks and heaps and exceptions that work with ROV, you can use either the Simple Link SDK, which supports many of TI's connected MCU products, or you can select Processor SDK RTOS, which supports TI's Citara processors and DSPs and other high-end ARM and DSP combinations. The links below here give you a number of resources for technical support and online training. I hope you enjoyed this session. Thanks for taking the time to listen.